Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello, bonjour et bienvenue. Herzliche willkommen. Hola et buenos dias. Buongiorno, bon dia, and hello. <laughs> I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International, and I've just welcomed you in seven different languages because Spiritual Awakenings International is truly an international network. Um, we have members currently in 56 countries around the world, just awesome to us, and close to 1,500 subscribers. So welcome, everybody. Um, if you want to take a minute now, we'd love it if you could enter into the chat where it is you're zooming in from around the world so that we'll know where everybody is that's joining us. We also have a number of people who are joining us on Facebook. For, so welcome Facebook viewers as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Vice President of Spiritual Awakenings International, Robert Baer, who's going to give some opening remarks. Robert? Thank you, Dr. Kaysan, and welcome everybody. Like Dr. Kaysan said, we're in 56 countries. This is gonna be a great event today. Uh, I have heard Richard Kelly speak before, and I think you're gonna really enjoy this. I first met him in Philadelphia at a conference, I heard him speak, and I am a retired policeman, 23 year veteran of a police department. And what he's about to speak on today really hit home to me. And I brought it up to several people that I know, several of my former colleagues, members of the Philadelphia Police Department that were there. And I think you're really gonna enjoy this. This is our inaugural event uh, of our uh, first responders, police, fire, and military. And it's a great program. It's being headed by our secretary, Linda Truex. And um, I just want, want you to know, this is gonna be a great presentation. I'm gonna turn this over to, um, actually, we're gonna cover one thing. There's gonna be a question and answer period <clears throat> at the end of the session. Please put your uh, questions in the chat box. Linda Truex, our secretary, will screen those and we will go over those at the end of the presentation. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to um, Kimberly Clark Sharp. And I wanna thank her and Seattle Lions for co-sponsoring this event. Kimberly. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> On a personal note, I can see some of the names of people chiming in here, and there are some people that I know and love that I haven't seen in a long time. So you know who you are, and uh, it's good to see your names. Good to know that you're still alive and kicking, too. So uh, a special welcome to um, the people I care about, but of course to those that I've never met, because we'll meet someday in the great beyond. Um, I am the group leader and co-founder of the Seattle International Association for Near-Death Studies, or Seattle IANDS. We are the co-sponsor, happily, of today's event. But my other claim here is that I'm married to a first responder. I'm married to a Seattle firefighter and paramedic. In fact, he supervised um, Seattle Medic One, the birthplace of 911, for 17 years. Also was on a SWAT team that supported first the FBI after Ruby Ridge and then uh, Pacific Northwest Regional uh, police officers in um, standoff situations. So I know something about watching a loved one go off to work and not knowing if they're going to come back again but probably assured that they will be experiencing trauma. And from a paramedic point of view, every single day there is trauma. So I'm really happy to be a part of this and, and grateful to have been invited to um, introduce Richard Kelly. Now, another thing, I never met Richard Kelly. We attended a, an IONS conference in outside of Philadelphia a couple of years ago 
never crossed paths. And I thought, well, I just can't read something about him. I wanted to get to know the guy. So uh, we had a phone call. And I thought, yeah, 10, 15 minutes of chit chat, that's fine. An hour and 10 minutes later, we finally got off the phone. We had to get onto lies. We'd still be talking. I'm crazy about this guy. I, I hope I have a friend for life now. Uh, we have a great deal of common. There are things that you will not have time to hear about. He said, tremendously interesting life. Very interesting, pleasant fellow to say the least. I, and also we had a couple of things in common. Uh, one being a certain pesky shoe on a ledge. And the other uh, that when I was resuscitated, I went through, this is, I had a near death experience. Uh, coming back from my NDE, I went through one of my first responders and knew all about that fellow. So just wanted to add that as Richard called the color commentary. So <laughs> I love that term. So here we go officially in the introduction. In a 1966 study, Dr. Richard Kelly found as many as 28% of the first responders studied reported sensing some sort of spiritual transformative experience, a presence or a communication from the victims of traumatic deaths. Yet these first responder STEs, if you don't know by now, is spiritual transformative experiences. Somebody we know coined the phrase, so yeah. wink. Um, yet these first responder STEs are rarely reported, and I will attest to that. Dr. Kelly will describe his study and discuss the liminal world of that transition to death from the perspective of those first responders who dedicate their careers to interrupting it. Dr. Richard Kelly, who is a doctorate in education and LCPC is a retired Massachusetts state police detective lieutenant and later served as the assistant chief of US Interpol Bureau, chief of the health and safety unit for the US Marshal Service and chief of the employee assistance unit of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, commonly called the FBI. He is an alumni of the Hyatt School of Psychology at Clark University Dr. Kelly is a licensed clinical professional counselor in Maryland, specializing in post-traumatic stress. He continues to provide psychotherapy in private practice. So it's with great pleasure and delight and interest that I welcome Dr. Richard Kelly. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, let me just fire this up, all right. Can you all see that? Okay, um, we're going to be talking today about the police officer, the firefighter, and the emergency service workers' um, place in the transition from physical life to whatever it is that um, exists after life. Um, I refer to it as the liminal. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the in-between, and it's what's difficult is trying to connect those two worlds. Um, that was the dilemma with uh, what I faced when I decided to do the study, um, was to put some sort of bridge between, rather than the usual argument of, yes, there is a spirit world, and yes, there's a physical world, and the two don't... Um, don't intersect much. Um, I, I don't believe that to be true. Um, and I was trying to provide some bridge. But um, I, I, this first slide, and I'm, I, for those of you that may or may not be able to read it well or whatever, I will read it to you. And I, I hate doing that. I don't like going to conferences where people read slides to you. But this one, I, um, it's from one of my favorite authors, uh, tra a Trappist monk, Thomas Merton from the 60s. Um, it says, day after day, the outward man crumbles and breaks down and the inward man, the man of heaven, is born and grows in wisdom and knowledge before the eyes of men who cannot recognize him. Neither can we recognize ourselves in the image of him, which is formed in us because 
we do not yet have the eyes for which to see him, and yet we suspect his presence in the mystery which is not revealed to the wise and prudent. We feel his eyes upon us as we sit under the fig tree and our souls momentarily spring to life at the touch of his hidden finger. Um, I think that's an, it sums up an awful lot of what goes on um, in the world between physical world and spiritual world. And it certainly um, uh, says a lot about um, what this, this uh, dissertation was about in this study. Um, okay, so let me find my, here we go. Here we go. So the life, the idea of the liminal, there's some evidence from this study, sensing a presence attachment and communication with deceased victims, there's something going on. Um, there's thousands of years and hundreds of thousands, millions of, of uh, descriptions of, uh, of those kinds of contacts between the living and the, the physically living and the other living. Given the incident rate of sudden traumatic deaths and the large number of these events that may be occurring, and they're probably underreported. So if, if my study is demonstrating that 17% um, of the police, fire, and medical folks that we studied definitely identified some sense of communication presence or attachment to these de recently deceased victims, the focus then comes, is that a particularly important moment? Um, and uh, these particular people, do they have some special place in that uh, transition? Um, and it then causes us to wonder how, off, how much of this is going on and, and where is it? So there's an awful lot of sudden deaths and there's an awful lot of uh, uh, police, fire, and medical. We'll sh we'll look at that in just a second. Um, what, is, what is it that might be occurring at these exchanges? What is going on? Um, and also uh, part of the, uh, the study was spiritual interventions, counseling interventions that took on a spiritual nature uh, to help the, because not all of these uh, emergency service workers were comfortable with that presence. Uh, not at all. And they certainly weren't comfortable telling anybody about it because it's not, not a group of people that are prone to um, discussing anything other than the very concrete of life. So, um, so this other research that tells us about that liminal period, that liminal time and place, um, this um, uh, all all sorts of additional mystical writings and uh, most religious, all, all religious practices mention it uh, in some way. So uh, there's huge evidence of a life after death and, a, um, and there's some evidence that there might be a connection um, between that dying moment. Um, it stands, study I think tells us or suggests that emergency service workers might be important figures um, to the physically deceased during that transition. Um, so, so here's the basics of that study. 17% of the people um, from the study, the, the, the core respondents that uh, met criteria, um, described one or more feelings of presence, attachment, or communication with deceased victims. 11%, another group from that study uh, who didn't fit the primary criteria, but there were 11% um, who also described other very related um, spiritually transformative experiences or connections um, or activity in that liminal. Um, so you could easily say 28% of the 20 of the population, the emergency service worker population are experiencing something uh, of that nature in the process of their their work. So, in terms of numbers, 
just the every year, or at least in the last couple of years in this country, 43,000 motor vehicle fatalities, 75,000 poisonings, 39,000 fatal falls, 30,000 accidental deaths from other causes, 16,000 murders, 48,000 suicides, 237 plus thousand sudden deaths in the United States. First responders are near at nearly every single one of them. Each event, therefore, would be a potential contact um, for that presence communication or, um, or feeling of communication. In the country, this, the, these here United States, there's about 800,000 police officers, local, county, state, federal. 1.2 million firefighters. The blur between firefighters and, e and uh, paramedics is so high and overlap that it, the, the determining if there's an additional separate uh, EM, uh, EMS only uh, isn't discernible. So this, so we're talking about two million professional, active, employed emergency service workers, and 237,000 accidental, sudden, um, or or uh, caused deaths every year. 17% of the 2 million is 340,000 emergency service workers in this country. At any given moment, one in six of them, who have, according, if that study holds, um, would show that one in six of them are experience, having similar experiences in, the, in their work uh, with the newly dying. Just as an extension of the of the the thought, and not studied here, was other populations that might be experiencing the same thing. And um, and I'll go back to one of the background pieces of it: emergency service workers do not talk about these things freely. Um, it's the nature of their business, um, just as with the military. Uh, it is important for an officer um, to maintain their sense of control over themselves. And in fact, it's their employment, their job to maintain control over the, everything else that's going on around them. That's why people call 911 is to regain control of whatever is going on in their life. So to explain to someone else an odd circumstance, something that isn't common, something that might question their stability or their ability to perform their, their duties or their trustworthiness in protecting others uh, is just not done. So, um, and I suspect that is true in these other populations that I mentioned. Um, the medical folks uh, are dealing with, um, dying folks all the time. And, and I'll uh, jump ahead a little bit. There may be a particular difference in the numbers of these communications because the deaths were sudden and that the, the EM, ESWs were there at the moment. We don't know that, uh, but these are other populations. Let me describe the, uh, the first case. We had a, um, uh, what we called the stress unit back in the state police. Um, this is mid seventies and um, not terribly different than what's going on today in terms of public uh, impression of, of law enforcement. A um, lot of changes, a lot of upheaval. Um, the Boston Police Department started a stress unit which they developed because they were finding high rates of alcoholism, divorce, suicide, um, other traumatic exposure uh, experiences, and uh, they started their program. And we, in the Massachusetts State Police, then followed suit very soon thereafter. Um, the stress unit, um, it was the psychological services unit was the fancy name, um, was, was the basis of, of how we came to meet 
uh, many of our officers in, in, in these circumstances. Um, we counseled them. We did the, we did the counseling because at that point myself, um, I had finished my first graduate degree. Um, I'd started off as a road trooper. I was out in the pump on the highways for three years and rural patrols for, for several years. And while I was going to school and coincidentally finished grad school around the time that they were opening their, Boston opened their program and we started ours. So because of, as I had just explained about the, the reticence of this population to uh, talk to people openly about any of their personal issues. Um, uh, it became clear to us, and Boston PD picked up on it first, that if you put something in house, if you put peers in really close by and you normalized it a bit quietly, um, then you'd more likely be able to reach the, uh, the employees, which turned out to be the case. So we instituted this stress unit and we started counseling troopers, their families. Uh, we counseled them on uh, marriage issues. We counseled them on death and dying issues. Uh, we would show up at their house if they had a tragedy at the home and help out and do the best, do whatever we could for them. Uh, we'd show up at their deathbeds in the hospital if they were dying from disease. and. Um, it didn't take long for us to gain trust uh, and acceptance. So all of that preamble to say this house painter case involved two firefighters from a local central Massachusetts fire department because we had already counseled a couple of police officers in that department. department. Most, um, most agencies in the state, and sadly today, do not have internal programs like that. So anybody that has one tends to get more business from the other people around them. My partner, uh, Phil Trapasso, retired captain of the state police, uh, and my partner for many years in the stress unit, he, we used to do a lot of training also. We would go out for awareness of normalized stress and try to explain to the troopers that they probably were crazy, but that was they were supposed to be given what they were doing. And um, they kind of understood that. And he used to say to me, every time you go out and, and give one of those talks, we wind up with more customers. So we developed quite a a bit of use. Uh, I'm not in, I'm going to jump ahead because uh, it kind of fits here. I'm not even sure I have a, um, a notation of it later on, but one of the things that we found by in instituting this program within the department and servicing all of those issues um, and training and getting to be known and normalized um, and because of all the different things that we were doing, um, we tracked that um, over a 10 year period. And what we determined from that and projecting out the numbers at the rate that people were coming to the stress unit, there was a 72% chance that any officer on that department was gonna come and see us at one time or another in their career. We refer to that as a saturation rate and very proudly, um, they they felt safe in coming to us, and their supervisors felt safe in making them come to us um, when that was the case. So um, that credibility um, mattered both in terms of the effectiveness of the counseling, but also the the reach that we had to other to people. So we had. We had a following from the outside. This Central Massachusetts Fire Fire uh, Department uh, chief noticed a couple of his officers. Just they had a call that they went on. It was kind of unusual, but not extraordinary. And he wasn't. They, was, they seemed to be a little bothered, so he sent them all away. Um, 
and they came because it wasn't their idea. As long as it's the supervisor's idea, then they don't have to say that they, they're having a problem. So they come to us and they did explain that they had been, they had had this um, uh, call. It was a little messier than the usual. It was a house painter. He was painting a house. He was on a scaffolding. Uh, he fell three stories eventually uh, hitting his head and uh, on the scaffolding on the way down to to the driveway below. Clearly significant injuries. He was still he still had vital signs when they arrived, um, but he just his uh, head injury significance pretty much made it clear he was not going to survive. One of the firefighters went with him to the hospital. The other one stayed back at the scene. And when he, all the way to the hospital, and this is, this is well, let me back up. He's, ex they were explaining it to me. And that's kind of usual traumatic exposure counseling. There's a certain protocols that we use in that, um, which back in the seventies was kind of new in itself. And it worked pretty well. We had quite a bit of experience with it and it seemed to help. Um, but there was still, they weren't getting the relief for the result from that that normally we would have expected. One of the firefighters stops and says, looks down at his shoes and he kind of says, you know, you're going to think I'm crazy, but now folks that have dealt with NDEs and know that that's, that's almost the preamble to 90% of them. So... He says, yeah, you're going to, and so, okay. And he said, well, all the way to the hospital in the ambulance, trying to can keep him, his vitals going, getting him to the hospital. Uh, and he did die shortly after arrival at the hospital. And he said, I felt like he was still there. I, and he would, he, the officer even pointed up into his right that he was up there watching me. And I just can't shake it. And he's still, like he's still doing it. And then his partner, who wasn't in the ambulance, said, yeah, I felt him too. So we were, it, that doesn't show up in your usual counselor training. Uh, and it doesn't show up in most emergency service work conversations. So we were kind of winging it. And we talked about it a bit, tried to normalize it as best we could. And, um, and then we kind of came to a good decision-making point of view therapeutically. Well, what are we going to do about this? What is it that you can do about it? Uh, you feel something, a connection, connection to this victim. And we simply decided that, well, it seems to be a spiritual issue, so let's come up with a spiritual solution. Um, we said, all right, um, what's, your, what's your faith practice? What do you do for if you have any sort of faith tradition, um, your belief system? And they both had uh, Christian backgrounds and uh, of sorts um, that I'll talk about later on, but um, and they said, okay, well, yeah, we could do this, that, and we explored, go to the services, go to the graveside, say some prayers, um, focus prayers, go to church just on that be behalf of the victim. Um, later on, coming to realize it resembled uh, what many religious practices call commendation. The, the idea of funeral services is just the spirit community to commend the soul of the deceased uh, to the afterlife. Um, and for whatever reason, this particular victim was clinging to them. And this process was going to um, hopefully uh, relieve some of that uh, need um, on a spiritual level. So we um, we had him, we had both of them conjure up something of their own and try to put it to practice. Make a long story short, uh, we did follow up sessions with them. Uh, they both did something. They weren't remarkable, or, uh, uh, but they did 
think about it in those terms. They did prayerfully think of this uh, uh, this victim, and they both acknowledged a sense of release um, of that. Uh, so uh, that was that was the first one. This is as I was talking about where they came from the in the unit. Um, these are the things that we did uh, as a, for, and I was in that unit for 13 years. So life went on in the stress unit. We were seeing people at a fairly rapid rate. Um, and another one comes up, but it wasn't, it was, I think it may have been a, a whole year separation. We get two police officers from a local police department. They had investigated a motor vehicle accident on New Year's Eve. It was a two car, uh, six person fatality. Um, a drunk driver crashed into a cab. Um, and as it later turned out, the cab driver was also one of the influence. Um, and the cab driver was from one of the one survivor um, was driving, they were all relatives in the car. He was doing them a favor by driving them home. Um, they, they arrived at that scene. They went to the driver's door. The driver um, was barely alive. Um, again, uh, they couldn't get him out because of the, the easily, um, the officers, um, proceeded to try to interact and get the scene. There's a lot of victims, there's a lot of people. In fact, they had kind of triaged that there wasn't anything they could do for that driver. Um, and they came back uh, to him and he eventually was removed from the scene. He was deceased. The officers came similarly because their supervisor had noticed that after that event, um, and these were well-experienced officers. Um, they, they, they would, and they, they weren't reluctant at all to, to come see us. And, they, and it was mirrored that you, the mirrored experience that you see when people first describe their NDE. They talked about it. We did the debriefing protocols. It kind of worked. And then one of them said, "You know, you're going to think I'm crazy, but." <laughs> And he described a sense from that driver who was totally unconscious at the time um, that he could feel him watching him. He felt him like he was connected to trying to communicate with him. And he proceeded to, I said, so just as a, not with the vast experience of one, but we asked him, well, where do you, and he described, he was up and to the right. Um, they could even identify the place. Now, in a lot of NDEs, later on learning in the research, the autoscopic viewing of people's own near-death uh, events is often up. And I have a personal question theory about whether it's up and to the right based on the handedness of the person or the reporter, but that's one of those strange little studies that nobody will ever do. But they all, they often describe the up, that autoscopic view of up and to the right. This officer was describing his sense of the presence of that victim up and to the right. Same thing. Now, now we had, we had experience and we recognized it as a spiritual issue and we talked to them and we said, well, let's see what you can do um, from a, spiritual point of view, um, which they both did. And I think in this case, they went to the grave, one of them went to the graveside, the other one um, went to church and had a, a service said in the name of the victim. And a follow-up showed that they had a sense of relief of that nagging feeling that the person just wouldn't go away. Because a lot of officers are are used to the idea of thinking about cases after they're done and they, you know, they nag them on the woulda, shoulda, couldas and 
that that part isn't uncommon, but the personal kind of personal connection that they described was different. And the fact that it didn't go away uh, the way it was supposed to uh, was different. And so between the, the counseling, which normalizes it to some degree, keeping in mind proper psychotherapeutic tenets, uh, that would make sense. But it never seemed to be enough until that spiritual release piece was added. So um, they went off and did their thing uh, and came back later. We followed up and uh, um, they said that there had been some effective relief from it. And it, it preceded, the event proceeded to then move on um, like regular ones do. Okay, so. Um, there were four cases in this course of um, the stress unit work that triggered the idea of, of putting this study together. Two of them had partners, the other two did not. So the four seminal cases um, uh, were, were what triggered it. So we looked at the idea of how, how much of this is going on. Uh, by the time I got to the fourth case uh, several years later, even my brain was able to figure out that there's something more than coincidence going on here. I just don't know what it is. And the first question was kind of in a, a mini way what Raymond Moody's book did back in the 70s of, okay, people are talking about these near-death experiences. How many people are talking about it? How many people are experiencing it? So I wanted to look at the, the how many. So we, we came up with a study design to be able to get a tangible number. And this is, this is the dilemma of this kind of research is getting the tangible to mix with the, the intangible. So we had our first, first four, six subjects. We had 20, at that point, we had 2,548 cases that we had had in that stress unit by then. Um, and we had files on them. And we sent out, a, we created a questionnaire, a very simple one, a uh, basic one. And we sent that out um, to a um, couple of different seminars of uh, collections of emergency service workers. The criteria for inclusion as subjects in the study were that the event that they were dealing with had to be traumatic. It had to be fatal. They had to be emergency service workers. The, they had to be present at the death and it couldn't have been their first, their first rodeo as an emergency service worker and that they weren't mentally ill in any like, majorly identifiable way. There's always a joke within law enforcement that if you aren't crazy when you go in, you will be by the time you come out. But um, that's it. they had no, no diagnosable illness. Um, and so if, if it met those criteria out of the 2,500 cases and the 130 questionnaire responses, then we would include their experiences as part of the study. And that's where you'll the difference is between the 17% primary and the 11% secondaries are, the secondaries are ones that missed one of those criteria. Third one comes up. This was in those seminal cases. A trooper, a young trooper, about. I think he had five, five years on the job, um, coming to work on an interstate highway, uh, nighttime, slow, uh, not much traffic. And he was coming up on uh, slowly gaining on a car in the right travel lane. Um, and he, he was in the middle lane. And as he started to pass, um, he noticed the car beside him coming to a, an immediate stop. And as soon as he caught that, he looked in front of him and there were two people uh, dead center in his, his um, uh, 
direction of travel to pedestrians, um, both of whom he struck. One was knocked off into the, uh, the street uh, a ways, I believe he survived. Um, the second one came up over the hood of the cruiser, through the windshield, and pretty much onto the lap of the trooper um, as he stopped the vehicle. So that by this time, the stress unit, we had policy within the department that any officer, any trooper that had been involved in a, we called it high trauma incident. It was a mandatory referral to us for just check up and a check. Um, took the stigma away, it became commonplace. People joked about it, nobody worried about it. Um, it worked pretty well. Uh, so he came, he described the accident. He was out injured for a little while because of some, some second small, smaller injuries for him, but still they weren't quite recovering as well as he wanted them to and uh, as fast as the docs wanted him to get back to work. So he uh, proceeded to describe this event and one of the things, one of the tools that we use in, in the counseling of traumatic exposures is to have the person describe the event as a, because they often see it as I used to say a videotape. Now I have to modernize that now. It's a YouTube video. Um, and in the process of that playing of that tape, because it's almost indelible, the traumatic memories come through like that. It's the same start, it's the same stop, um, and it rolls when it starts. And we would ask them to describe it to us if, it, we, if in fact it was that kind of a visual linear uh, memory. We would ask him to describe it to us and then we would ask him to describe it again only if there's a place along the way where you would kind of feel like there should be a pause button, um, let us know. And that was usually pretty effective in telling us where the hidden spots were <laughs> um, because the pause buttons were very important usually. Um, so uh, he described it and he said the pause button was is when he saw the, the shocked face of the person in the headlights uh, just before he struck them. Now keep in mind what had happened was that the two people that were the pedestrians weren't on their way home to you know to meet everybody for supper they were out there that night both had been drinking and they were playing chicken with the cars and when they saw looked up the road to see the car that they were going to play chicken with which was the car that the trooper was passing they only saw the headlights of that car so that's why it caused them to totally misjudge seeing where the trooper was so they were shocked. Uh, so he remembered the face of that individual uh, just before he struck him. And we pushed that a little further as that protocol calls for and it works well. And what we found was that the actual moment, the more traumatic piece of that memory was the face of him coming just before it came through the windshield. Um, so we did a nice job on all of our protocols and it still wasn't the same. He said there's still a piece um, that he, he felt personally connected to that victim. He didn't feel guilty, so to speak. He felt he understood his responsibility, but he wasn't guilty. And he, but he felt a, a connection and a, and as if he was, there was something more he was supposed to do for him. Same process, spiritual issue, spiritual solution. Um, he did in fact, the trooper did in fact, um, um, take that to heart. Um, it, the idea of the spiritual connection uh, in, in all of these cases lightened them up tremendously to think that there was some explanation. Uh, 
and not just a, a, a thin, thinly veiled um, uh, projection of somebody else's thought. So he did his due diligence and did perform uh, his, his uh, we referred to it as reverent act, and uh, there was a release. The victim no longer was attached to him. Uh, and he returned to work, followed up on it, and he returned to work. So um, so the study respondents, the ones that we get back from all of those sources, five original subjects, one of them had died. One of the police officers from the, the New Year's Eve case had, had died of cancer since. We got 62 questionnaire respondents, 50 anonymous, 50 anonymous and 12 self-identified. And we got 28 subjects we culled from the 2,500 uh, cases that we had dealt with, including the five originals. So that was the body of our respondents, just, um, just under 100. The last seminal case was a trooper in the western part of the state um, as a, a note of perspective in Massachusetts, there are no county police. Uh, there's one, there's one county that has an actual police department, but it's either the, it's either the city or the town police or the state police. Uh, there aren't any other spares. <laughs> so, uh, um, in rural Massachusetts, um, state police are doing the full range of policing there. He's out on patrol, gets a call. There were several teenagers, left an underage drinking party, ran off the road and went into a river. And the river out there is kind of a, a rocky bending, varying shallows, uh, kind of rapids uh, type of a waterway. Car goes into the river, he gets to the scene pretty quickly um, and there's a bunch of distraught teenagers. He helped get a couple of them back to shore and they're, they're really upset because this, one of them is missing. There was a young girl that was missing. Other uh, units arrive, they start doing medical care for the other victims and um, he goes into the water waist deep and cold, cold in the best of times uh, in that part of the state and is searching in the water for the body of this girl. He just about gives up on it. And he, for a reason that he could never explain, he felt that he felt compelled, he needed to look down and he looked down and actually saw the face of her. She was caught on a, a log or something and she was looking up. Uh, on, apparently unconscious, but um, he was able to retrieve her, got her to shore, CPR, they regained uh, um, vital signs, got her to the hospital, but she stayed in a coma for about a week um, and, and died in the hospital. Uh, the trooper did the best he could, uh, but he felt bad, felt a connection, felt personally attached to that victim. Not his first rodeo, um, certainly nothing, I mean, it doesn't happen every day, thank goodness, but he'd been through worse, but was personally attached to that victim. And he um, couldn't shake that. He, with the protocol came, that's he gets sent to us because of, of policy. Um, same thing, the usual counseling protocols work. In, and remember also in perspective, we had thousands of cases and these, these cases came in intermittently. So it wasn't as if we had a presumption that they needed to be um, thought of as something special or NDEs or spiritual events going on. Um, it was almost as surprising to us as it was to them. Uh, although by the time we get to the fourth one, we, we were starting to, we, we had some real questions about how many? He did his, um, he, 
one of his issues was he wanted to he wanted to see her in the hospital, but there was some resistance from the family. Uh, he was also the investigating officer for the accident. Um, and um, when she died, uh, he did follow through with, um, uh, with a number of things for his, his reverent act turned out to be reverent acts. He would go to the hospital, uh, go to the uh, graveyard and go back to the scene a couple of, once or twice every week. Um, partially because he had a relative buried in the same graveyard and he lived in the area so it wasn't he wasn't out of his way but he would just stop there for a little bit um, and there was um, one particular um, visit where he would sit on a little hill overlooking the scene and he felt the movement of the of the wind the leaves the trees um, and he had been each of these trips he would pray um, for her, not in any particular, knowing any particular reason uh, or uh, focus, but just praying for her. And that, that one event, that one moment um, of all that motion, he felt he, he equally as strongly felt the release that she had unhooked from him. Uh, and it never came back. Just as a small, interesting codicil to that, several years later, he had a similar, almost identical experience. Same patrol area, same damn river, same drunken teenagers, different, different drunken teenagers. They go into the river, he gets there, um, and there was one victim that wasn't recovered. It was a young female. She was still in the car. He, he helped rescue the others, helped them get medical attention, investigated. Everything was the same, including the, the one dead female victim. He did not feel attached to her. He did not have that same feeling there. And in the discussions that we had, he said, I never, I never touched her. I never saw her. I just never felt personally connected to that victim. And what moved him tremendously, the, the concept in our discussions to him that moved him most powerfully was when we brought up the idea that perhaps it was because he was the last, that she, his first victim, had actually died at the scene and that he was the last living soul with her when that had happened. And that struck him like lightning. That made so much sense to him. Um, so uh, how you quantify that? I don't know. Um, just trying to get a grip, grip on this small piece of prevalence, if nothing else. So. This was the question that we used in the, in the survey. Have you ever felt a presence, communication of some kind, or a feeling of attachment from a deceased victim? That's, uh, that was the extent of it. We didn't want to narrow it down too tightly uh, as to lose data, and we didn't want to leave it too broadly as to not be able to rely on the information that we did get. The 15 primary subjects related to us 23 separate events. Several reported multiple experiences ranging from anywhere from three to 17. One of the, the uh, questionnaire, the write-in respondents estimated um, that he had had 100 um, experiences where he felt some connection to the victim. And someone else who said all um, so that's, again, the, the struggle with how you phrase your questions. Uh, in each case, the subjects, the ones we interviewed, they clearly denied that it was a sense of imagination. These were, these were more than just the usual woulda, shoulda, coulda, and I wonder, and I wonder how he's doing. Um, 
they, it wasn't imagination. It wasn't inner voices. Uh, they weren't under any unusual stress beyond trying to perform their perform at that scene and was a mental, mental illness. They all recognized it as unusual. Um, so there was something different about these events. So one of the things that makes you wonder about that liminal, excuse me, we have a, well, this, this quote by Stephen Levine. Stephen Levine is a, an author, a philosopher, author who writes often on death and dying topics. Um, but I thought this was wonderfully uh, poignant to the, the study. And he says, I was brought up to think that when people died in their sleep, that was the best possible death. I now see that a sudden death may not be as fortunate as we have been conditioned to believe. Someone who has popped out of their body without much preparation, like a teenager in the fullness of life, who has a fatal accident may, after the smoke clears, wonder what the hell was all that about? What happened to my body? I can't be dead because this is all still happening around me. If there is life, if there is, in, in much of the research now in these combined fields I'm uh, interested in seeing, is moving towards a, a concept of consciousness rather than getting into the nomenclature battles of calling it a soul or anything else, but consciousness as something that um, can exist separate from the body. If that's the case, when the body dies, what does the consciousness think? And as Levine points out, it doesn't necessarily presume that the consciousness is going to be so sharp and, and aware that it'll understand what happens. And I, I'm projecting a little here beyond the limits of what was studied, but when that, this, that period or that space between um, the, uh, the liminal, that space between the physical life of the consciousness or its attachment to a physical being and whatever afterlife is, um, is that liminal period, liminal meaning on the edges of things. And um, I'm not sure that we can guarantee that we'll be any wiser in the liminal than we were when we were here, um, but perhaps and hopefully a little better understanding of how to deal with it. So, so what is happening? Um, we don't know. Um, at least I haven't figured it out. Um, is it a constructed perception from personal beliefs? Um, what's happening in these liminal moments for the deceased? Uh, is it a non-spiritual paranormal sensation? Uh, is it some yet-to-be-discovered neurochemical phenomena? That, and that's been the... As I looked at the literature over the years, it's there's a, a dichotomous battle between it's all chemical or it's all spiritual. It can't be. There's no both. Um, we just those two worlds have trouble fighting it out. Um, and I don't know. I'm not weighing in on that. I'm just offering my particular piece here. Um, what else, what other ways are there to look at it on the spiritual side? Is it a spiritual reaction to the confusion of death? Um, spiritual need for commendation? Uh, every religious practice uh, forever has always felt a need. Where, do they got the, where they got that from? I don't know, um, but they all do it. And uh, um, is it a last contact with the living that makes these emergency service worker interactions particularly different? Um, is it the fact that the emergency service worker is a kindred spirit by their profession and by their intention? Um, is it that makes them more available to a, a distressed consciousness? Um, if the cases, if the, if the confusion is higher, in a traumatic death, then perhaps the prevalence um, of 
contact with kindred spirits or other people there would be higher in the traumatic deaths? Is it lower in non-traumatic deaths? People that are, are going through an extended death and dying period where they're, they're, or aged or they've got strong spiritual beliefs, um, is it less likely to have any contacts um, with emergency service workers? Um, just these are more questions, they're, they're not answers, they're just questions. Uh, Near-death experience study of deceased poses uh, a significant methodological design problem. They always talk about that in NDE research. You can't, and this is the medical, the medical argument is you can't study it because if they're really dead, then if they came back, then they really weren't completely dead and therefore that doesn't count. Um, that's a pretty self-serving closeout of an argument, but it, there's some real design problems on getting good data from the deceased as a whole. Um, those are just questions. So um, related experiences. Now, um, these are all very well known in the near-death study literature, um, these, these references, these places that, uh, um, that I mentioned here, um, where they, they talk about uh, um, all of these are places where people have talked about attempts to contact. All right, there was a specific piece of a subset of this, the, the cases that came through on this study where it would seem that the victims were trying to make contact with the emergency service workers. It was, there was some attempt to reach them, communicate with them. In the near-death literature, there are some references to that. Um, there's not, to my knowledge, there's not much reference of that contact being successful. Um, um, you know, it, even, even when people who can describe their near-death experience afterwards will say, well, I was there, I could hear, I could see, I could, um, and only in rare instances do they mention trying to communicate with the, the, the living. Uh, but in these instances that in, cited here, there are, there's a few, few cases. Um, the, I mentioned, I mentioned this, this, the, the, the infamous sneaker on the ledge, it's a shoe on the ledge. I've been, my, I've been much better informed on that event. Um, and these are cases where people have had some pretty credible documentation of who have had near-death experiences of attempts to contact the, the people that were there at the time of their death. So um, mostly not successful. One of them, I think it was in the Sabam um, book, uh, talked about a person that had a autoscopic, meaning uh, um, out of out of body viewing of themselves in the while the in the emergency room while everyone was working on their body and they went out into the hall, hallway of the, the room and still unaware that confusion of the the actual nature of their condition and tried and saw a, a hospital employee down the hall and approached them and wanted to talk to them and the employee walked through them. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's some difficulty with that. Uh, apparently, um, the ability of the person in that condition to actually communicate with the living. Kimberly mentioned to me on that wonderful um, phone call that we had, um, she talked about in her near-death experience being going into the, the mind consciousness of the person that was saving her life. Um, and she could, she could communicate well in terms of understanding what was going on inside of him. I don't think there was any um, joined response, but um, there was definitely a contact. Um, 
and I that part hasn't been looked at um, in any great detail, but it certainly was a piece of what was showing up in the people that we studied in this 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 particular research. So now moving on to the reverent act part of these events for them. Um, this is something I used to slide a head around for a hundred years. Um, for those of you that have questions about the godliness of the FBI, I used to show this at the uh, auditorium at the end of many of the, uh, the any of the talks that I would give on uh, psych services, employee assistance. Prayer shouldn't be the last resort. Prayer may be the best approach. Um, and the real struggle may be spiritual. Um, there are whole pastoral counseling theories based on uh, mental illness being a spiritual illness. Yeah, I think partially. Um, I think as long as we're trapped inside this pile of protoplasm, um, there's some real tangible things that we need to do here with that. Um, spiritual is always there and should not be left to the, oh, well, we can't do anything else, so let's just pray. So the Reverend Acts, this is, this is the questionnaire side that we gave people regarding Reverend Acts. We asked them, have you ever prayed, attended services, or performed some other similar act on behalf of a deceased victim? Briefly, what is your belief in life after death? and briefly describe the extent of your religious belief and practice. Now, this, keep in mind, this was very experienced uh, law enforcement, um, firefighters, and EMS. You may not, well, part of, this, part of this response makes sense, and part of it is, might be a little surprising. 92% described having a general belief in God. Okay. 71% said they didn't practice their religion actively. That, that's not hard to believe. Um, and 76% described a belief in life after death. And 68% described praying or attending services for deceased victims. That one knocked me over. Um, they're, they're big believers in God, not too crazy about organized religion, um, but they have, there's something going on inside them and they are praying um, in that wider defined, wide, widely defined term or attending services for deceased victims. Um, so I, I'm, I was, I was so, so much appreciated, appreciative of their, their doing that. So this is just a review of the, the four seminal cases um, from a Reverend Act point of view, which I've described in the first four. And, they, um, and the fact that there was clearly, uh, from a counseling point of view, a decided benefit from those Reverend Acts that they performed on behalf and a decided psychological benefit on having a sense of release from the personal attachment. The sawmill was, uh, was an, uh, an event uh, that came uh, through the study. Trooper was assigned uh, to a rural area, got called to an industrial accident, shows up at a sawmill big logging mill grindings and one, there were two people working in the mill at the time. The, the mill the saw was off, which is a huge circular saw. And the victim was straddling the blade doing some maintenance adjustments. And the other employee didn't realize where he was and turned it on. Um, he was eviscerated almost up to his breastbone. Um, so there was survivability just wasn't a question. And um, the pictures of the scene um, after the fact showed the victim to be down, head down and all. The trooper that arrived came and they had him covered over with a blanket 
uh, at the time. He pulled the blanket away and he was kind of facing him. And his recollection was incredibly strong uh, and unmistakable that he was looking into his eyes and that he was, he felt, and he, he very uh, experienced trooper, um, Marine Corps of Vietnam, combat veteran, uh, drug unit detective. I mean, not a guy that's uh, easily uh, uh, shocked. But when he looked at that victim, he saw his eyes and felt um, him calling him in a way asking for help was the way he felt. He said it was a telepathic message. It wasn't a voice. Um, it was just an image with that. And it caused him to pray for him, tell him it's okay, you're gonna be all right. He's repeating this in his head several times. And then he was distracted away from that. And when he came back, he saw that his head was down and he no longer felt that attachment. The, the event was so strong to him that he didn't tell anybody. Um, it was only that the study came up um, that he was able to remark on that event. Um, but it was clearly a very different and defined um, connection to that deceased victim in a very specific way. The fugitive case was a, a case with a... Um, a trooper that um, had, uh, a, no, it wasn't a trooper, it was a local police officer. So he and his partner uh, had been at a roadblock. Um, a, a fugitive a felon um, was trying to evade uh, police, uh, came to the intersection that they were blocking and stopped for a moment and then started to drive towards them uh, to run the barricade, run them over. And the officer shot and killed him with a 12 gauge. And um, he came to us for a debriefing afterwards. Uh, and um, it went well. Uh, it's in the parlance of policing, it was a good shoot, um, which just means you're not likely to get sued. Um, and he wasn't proud of it, but he understood it. Um, so we contacted him later um, and talked to him and he, um, he said, um, we asked him the question, have you ever prayed, you ever felt the presence? He said, well, you know, I, I do. Um, he well, later went on to be a detective and he says, I, at every death scene, he says, I've always, I've always felt like they were watching me. So I, I act accordingly. And he says, and I, he sees was a Catholic. So he says, and I pray a rosary for every one of them. And I said, so they're all watching me. And, and, and it's just matter of fact to him. He didn't think too much of it. And I asked him, I said, well, were, were there, was there anyone of all of those death scenes that you, you didn't feel that presence on? And he stopped for a second and he said, yeah, the guy I killed. So I guess whether this that's a, a significant um, view of it in his mind or whether there's a difference in the connection between the victims, don't know. More questions uh, without answers. So, um, so the 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 reverent act piece, which uh, I don't think was emphasized too much in the Ions journal article um, is a whole nother area of research in its own, but I don't think they should be peeled apart too much. They need to be still connected. Okay. So kind of as a, a bit of a summary, beneath the public and the mutual awareness of the emergency service folks, there's thousands of first responders are praying silently every day for victims. Given, given the population's current view of police um, 
And that's the, that's the population that I worked with for 22 years. Gruff and caustic and, and cold and on the surface, and, but that's who they are underneath. They go into the occupation to try to make the world better and to have a little more control over it and, and use that for other people's benefit. And um, it is a hard, hard ideal to hang on to after, after a while. But according to them, um, and there's no reason to lie to me on that one, they're praying every single day. Thousands of them are. Most of them are silent prayers. Some of them go to services, some go to grave sites. They don't tell each other about it. They don't tell anybody else about it. Um, the only time that really comes up um, is today, May 15th. This is National uh, Memorial Day, P police officers, police week. This is the day, and I don't know if they'll do it this, this year, um, when the roll call of all of the, just the line of duty deaths uh, called out from the West Lawn of the Capitol. Uh, that is the moment where police in, are able to um, let their guard down and show uh, a connection to the, the loss, the spiritual loss or the physical loss of their colleagues. Other than that, they keep it to themselves. And I don't think that's helpful to them. Um, I don't know where this would lead in terms of um, if, they, if they became more aware of others feeling these ways, um, whether they'd be still let their guard down. I, I would be somewhat skeptical, uh, but I think it might be helpful if they heard it somehow. So this is um, this is a thing from a Texas physician. One of the books, uh, Stephen Levine's book. Um, it's a prayer that this Texas physician says that the every death that he is at the presence of, he says. He doesn't know if it does anything for them, but he knows it does something very useful for him. He says to them, let go, go on. You've only died. Don't be confused. Let love guide you. Let go into the light. So from a medical point of view, that's kind of the bridge. And I think that bridge exists in emergency service folks and crusty old cops and grizzly old firefighters and paramedics and um, who are out there still doing what they're supposed to be doing. So there you have it. So do we have questions? Yes, uh, Richard, could I get you to stop sharing your screen? Sure. All right, there we go. Uh, Richard, I did get to hear your presentation in Philadelphia two years ago, and I came home and I spoke to my neighbor, who's a young man. He's uh, newly into the police force. Had him excited about hearing the tape, but then I lost the recording. I will be taking this one to share with him, along to my county sheriff to see if I ah. get them to listen. Okay. Wonderful to hear this. Uh, so yeah, we had a lot of greetings from people from internationally and across the country. And our first question actually came from a law, a retired law enforcement officer, and that's Robert Baer. So he's asking, did you ever counsel an officer that was involved in a violent fatal shooting incident in which he or she was responsible for the death of an individual? And as a result, the deceased spirit attached themselves to the officer. If this happened, did the spirit cause havoc or turmoil to the officer in their life? Um, the simple answer is no. The closest would be that uh, last one that I discussed um, where the officer had uh, killed the individual that was trying to run him over. Um, uh, but they, and he clearly decided, he declared there was no attachment from him and he felt a sense of presence of all the others. Um, many officers in the process of the counseling over the years and uh, of shootings and um, which 
blessedly doesn't come up as much as the news media would imply. Um, just as a, a brief public service announcement, th there's 65 million police encounters every year, 800,000 police officers, and a thousand result in the death of the of the uh, uh, civilians. Um, this year is a record number of line of duty deaths. Uh, I think we're up well over 200. Uh, it had been down to about 150 or so. Uh, there was a number of deaths related to COVID exposure uh, for law enforcement, but, but nevertheless, uh, the number of the, so the officers involved in shootings feel, they feel very strongly, um, I haven't, I haven't counseled any police officer involved in the shooting that felt good about it. Um, they feel okay. They feel um, they they feel sad that it had to happen. They feel beleaguered. Uh, they, there's a lot of things that go on, but there's none of them that, unlike television and movies, that they feel, well, you know, the bastard deserved it. It just just doesn't happen. Um, it doesn't happen that often. The average police officer, at least old numbers was shoots and kills somebody once every 25 years. So it's a, with 800,000 of us and the average career length being about 23 years. And there's a couple of, a couple of folks that are because of their assignments are uh, having more than one event. Um, most of us are blessedly able to get off the hook without ever having to experience that directly. So, but a sense of responsibility, it's very, it's very powerful. It's taken incredibly seriously, and just the just the horror of having had to do do that to someone, no matter how how necessary the event or the shooting might have been, um, that uh, that lives with them. But I have not, in, in direct answer to the question, not aware of any officers that uh, felt the attachment of that uh, deceased victim. I wouldn't discount it, just not hearing it. Okay. Um, I am gonna go back. There was one previous question from Leo and I'm just reminding when this came up, you were talking about the different types of replies people get. And one of the respondents said uh, he's had a, a hundred incidents and another one says it happens on all of his encounters. And mm -hmm. the question is, was the person involved either admitting to or having psychic or mediumistic tendency? And that's again, reflecting that first responder that said he's had hundreds of incidents of contact and or all. Yeah. Yes, and I think, I think um, knowing the population and the people that uh, in the study, um, that's a consequence of the, the wide variation um, on how we defined, have you ever had a contact presence? And, um, and I, that, that came from a questionnaire. So if we had had a chance to interview that person specifically, uh, I think that might have, that number may have come down. Um, but not, it also keep in mind that like that other officer that I mentioned, he felt he felt everybody at every death scene there was somebody there. It wasn't he wasn't distressed by it, but he felt their presence, like he, they were watching him, and um, he just was respectful of that. Um, now, whether that would be defined as a medium, I don't know. I'm not sure we can define that uh, well. Uh, people some. People have intuitions. People have charismatic uh, gifts, uh, and I, and that is the. Yvonne has to worry about that more, far more than I. This is the world of of the confluence of the different uh, approaches to what's universal to us all. We are all going to die, um, and something probably happening, and we don't know what that is. And there's so many. You know that old image of the, the, the fence with the holes in it? We're all looking at the elephant. It's a big fence and there's a lot of holes. Um, so um, I, I, I would, and I, and I always hesitate 
to go near definitions and particular words. So um, whether that officer, those officers had a tendency for medium, I can tell you this, if they had a tendency for that, they wouldn't be bragging about it in the police department. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, he goes on a little bit further. Leo has another question. He says, I feel that people choose their past and are these types, uh, kinds of past for spiritual reasons. Call it karma if you want. But we are drawn to the paths of experience or incarnate for specific reasons. So that they would tend, I believe, to be open to it. And I think he's alluding to contact from the other mm -hmm. side. Yeah. Yeah, then, and I think that's very correct in that in a broader view, if there's if there is a world of spirit, personally, I think so. Um, how you define it and how how you respond to it um, is a matter of of personal choice and free will to some degree. Keeping in mind DNA and childhood experiences and all of the things that determine how we act and behave, um, it's a classic example of the philosophical argument or theological argument between a marionette God and a watchmaker God. You know, to, to, if there's a God, did he kind of create the earth and send, wind it all up, put all the parts in and then just set it on, set it down and is kind of watching? Um, and it all just happens the way it happens? Or is he a marionette God where he's kind of in, in, intricately involved in every little motion and all? I don't think either of those are accurate, um, but I think there's a there's some level of spirit, kind of to give away a Jesuit the mystical theologian Tilia de Chardin talks about his one of his phrases is the world is luminescent with God's presence. That somehow, somewhere, it's everywhere in all times and all things. Now, can we tap into that? Can we dial it up? Can some people are more intuitive to it than others? I don't see luminescence when I look out there, but I love the idea that he can um, or could. Um, should I still be using can if he's, he's deceased physically? But I mean, you can go on. There's, there's, there is an interaction and we can choose these things. And I think that's the dilemma that we're in. We want to think that it's clear and understanding um, and that there's rules to it and this is the way it works. And the more we understand it, the more we can uh, appreciate it. But I don't think there's any one way to understand it. I think it's just a different hole in the wall, different part of the elephant we're looking at. Okay, well, I, I, I can appreciate that reference to Chardin. I, he also gives a definition of Omega which yes. uh, yeah. is very in line to what you were just sharing. Mm -hmm. So we had a comment from Sarah. She said, I was with my mom when she died in the hospital. She was pronounced dead and I was left alone with her body. She didn't move, but spoke to me urgently saying, donate my eyes. It turns out that her grandfather was blinded and she stated that she wanted her beautiful eyes donated after death, maybe because of that. Mm. And I thought that was an interesting comment because of the stories you related to us. The only one that really had a message that I caught was the windmill victim, uh, the sawmill victim. Yes. Yeah. Supposedly passed a message on. Mm -hmm. yeah, Were there the, others that gave a message to well, the first the, responder? The other, the others definitely were clinging to these officers. Um, and many of the officers in their descriptions referenced, I felt like they wanted me to do something. You know, they, there was, it was, wasn't a, they weren't buddying up for, you know, beers afterwards. They were clinging, they were seeking, they were trying to get, get them to do something more for them. Um, the messages weren't very specific. Um, in the sawmill one, it was pretty clear. That was that was right on target. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about other fields where this study could be expanded, such as emergency rooms and the hospice. 
And when uh, Sarah reminded us that there is a great book out there, it's called Near Death in the ICU, and mm -hmm. it's stories from patients near death and why we should listen to them. And mm -hmm. it was written by Dr. Lauren Belge, and she's concerned about speaking out as well. So she is an emergency yeah. room physician. So yes, yes, yeah. yeah Not sure she did a study. She just shared what she observed. So. And that you know, as I re did the background research. For the dissertation, there's a there's a whole lot of information out there. Um, but in terms of trying to put numbers to it, uh, to make to, to bridge that gap between science and, and theology or philosophy or paranormal psych, it's fraught with danger. It didn't. You know, Okay, we seem to be getting a little bit of confused of breaking. I'm not sure if it's yours or mine, but we're going to continue on. There's another comment of accolades here from greetings, and it says this message needs to be made into a documentary for PBS. I think a lot of people would benefit from sharing the message of your study. Um, also sharing from Chuck that during the study, were there any cases where a police officer was present when a partner died and a time of death, time of death spiritual connection was established between the living officer and the dying officer? I've counseled several um, officers who have lost partners over the years. And those follow, the ones that I've done have seemed to follow a pretty traditional post-traumatic stress counseling protocol. Um, and of course, at this, at this time, I, the first counseling session I ever did was with a trooper in 1977. So I'm, I'm old. Uh, this, is, this is taking a while. Now I just automatically introduce the idea of whether they, you know, have had some, some sort of prayer or, or help to them, uh, you know, and that, uh, so maybe the, it, there's a, it's just a smoother line to go from the standard psychological practice to uh, uh, introduction of reverend acts or spiritual things, you know, and at the same time, using modern, more modern psych tools like eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing, EMDR, um, yes. I'll throw at whatever I've got, I'll throw at them uh, to, to help them be more resolved and feel better. In fact, in line with this audience, um, there was one officer I, who I, who came to me partially retired, 40 years of experience who came. And one of the things he brought was that his partner had been killed, shot and killed. And it always bothered him, always bothered him a lot, which made sense. And I actually used EMDR um, on that and um, it worked wonderfully. Um, and then he talked about the, the next one on his list of fun things that he'd experienced. And that was the, uh, the death of a young girl in a car accident. Um, and he had visual images of her on the street uh, deformed and very badly injured and all and deceased and he um i used emdr on that event also and he he explained about i think it was about a month later or so he was at church and which he attended regularly in the same church and kind of knew most everybody there. And he looked to his right and there was a young girl there who he hadn't seen before, but you know, that didn't throw him off too badly. And when he, I, at the time of the, in the service, actually there's some people held hands and she held his hand and he said it would almost electrified him. And he just had this, incredibly vivid image of that girl on the street and a message to him that I'm okay and never saw her again um, but you know, so I these you know it's 
Is that his, that, is that his imagination? Could very well be. Could be what he had for breakfast triggering a certain neurochemical discharge that led to that kind of confluence of thought and cognition. Could be that. Uh, could have been a little girl wrapped up in somebody else's body. Could I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just only aware of the questions. Well, that kind of leads into the next uh, question people are asking. And uh, it's got a question, then some narrative, and I'll go back and repeat the question. It's from Tamara. Don't you feel an attachment could be that the first responders may be a trusted face that they may cling to, and the spirit may be confused that they are dead? I feel it is so kind for these officers to pray for a spirit's peace and passing into the light. As a medium, I know they hear those loving prayers from us here. Those prayers, love, and concern from all the officers alone help the spirit person understand their state and what happened to them. What a gift. This spiritual phenomenon and solution to it really needs to be taught in their training. Thank you for your speech. You are a delight. And I hope your studies from you and others like you continue. So again, her initial question was, don't you feel an attachment could be that the first responders may be a trusted face that they may cling to? And I, I do. I think of one of the my quick references and one of the thousands of words that fly by on those slides was, why them? Why these particular officers? Because there are other officers at these scenes. And um, it, so there's, a, there's several variables that we really don't know about. Why that particular officer? Is it their intuition? Is it the, the earlier question you're talking about with some people uh, to choose a path um, that allows them to be more tuned to it. Um, goes back to the first slide with Thomas Merton saying, well, yet we do not have eyes to see it yet. Uh, some people are more tuned than others. Um, so I, I do think uh, there's a number of variables um, that go into whether that officer is chosen by the victim, or whether in fact um, they're just more open. Uh, there was a wonderful, I missed this presentation, I'm so sorry, but the, uh, at, the, at the last IONS conference, Dr. Nathan, uh, Father Nathan uh, Castle, the Dominican um, from the West Coast, I think, um, yes, wrote a book, um, I think it, Death Interrupted, I think was the name of it. And he, he describes from his 20s or so, receiving kind of like visits from spirits in his sleep, which he clearly was able, even then, when they were first happening, realize they weren't just dreams. So he developed a, a habit of making notations and, um, and trying to figure out what what's going on with the make a long story short he it's turned into a practice of his where he seeks a prayer partner for safety security and strength and after he if he gets a visit um, they will then go into prayer for that person to seek them out to see if there's something they can do for them and has a lot of uh, interactions with people in that way, spirits in that way. Um, I found that it kind of follows on that uh, uh, attempted contact. Uh, now it's posthumous and it's with him and why him? And that's, which is one of his questions, why me? And um, he even amazingly got permission from his abbot or bishop to um, publish the book. So um he's very conservative and cautious about it all is rightfully so um, but there why him well he is a dominican he's now a dominican priest and uh has been for years so uh you could see the idea of a kindred spirit being a little more likely there than you would some 20 year old cop who's all grizzled over and uh a little rough on the outside, but soft on the inside. Um, so 
So yeah, I don't I don't know what the variables are. Yeah. So Richard, you described that your department was a little hesitant to start a program that served your members so well. I can understand people coming into your presence and who would be very comfortable sharing with you. It's been a wonderful presentation and we're so glad you've been with us. So I don't have any more questions at this time. I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly Clark Sharp. Thank you. I, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's my eloquent response to your presentation, Richard. Uh, hey, Linda, do I have a moment to tell a story I've never shared? Sure. Please. So a few years ago, um, IONS, International Association for Near Death Studies, had a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, an old pal of mine, and actually my mentor, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Kubler Ross, um, famous sanitologist. If you don't know of her works, look her up. Uh, she had died. And uh, Diane Willis, a member of SAI, uh, along with Chicago Ions, uh, was also a friend. So we decided to go out to Elizabeth's. Uh, cemetery and look for her grave and pay our respects. So uh, we drove out there. We could not, what's the large cemetery? We could not find her grave anywhere. We combed it. It was weird. And at one point, sorry about my phone ringing. I'm sure it's someone asking about an extended warranty for our car. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Um, so, uh, but Diane did see two dragonflies. And she said, oh, dra uh, dragonflies are often a symbol of the deceased. So um, we followed the dragonflies, still didn't find the dang grave site. Had to get back to the conference. The next day, I had friends in uh, Phoenix who picked me out for a visit. And I complained about the fact I couldn't find Elizabeth's grave. So they took me out to the cemetery and we still couldn't find a grave site. But I came across a fully uniformed police officer, I mean, in dress uni on a hot Arizona day, this was end of summer, who was at a grave um, with a bicycle. And he said, so we got back, yeah, we talked because there was no one else in the cemetery. And uh, it, he uh, he said he was visiting the grave of his partner. Uh, his partner had been killed in the line of duty by accident, hit by a car on his bicycle. Uh, they were both bicycle cops. And so this was his annual visit to the grave site. And then he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm trying to find the grave of our friend. And I didn't identify who the friend was. I just said a friend. He said, he pointed very clearly and said, it's right over there. So I went, oh, okay. So I trotted right over there and there was the grave, like right under our nose, how did we miss it? And my friend said, how did you just walk over here? And I said, that cop, that cop, that cop. Yeah. They had seen him from a distance and they had seen the bicycle, fortunately, or I just go, <laughs> I have goosebumps telling this story. Again, I've never shared it. But uh, what was a fully dressed, formal, uniformed police officer with a bicycle doing at that grave? And how did he know where the grave was? I mean, my mind goes to a vision that that might have been the deceased uh, visiting his own grave. Uh, we were all near-death experiencers, those who were out at the cemetery. But um, the fact that he had died in the line of duty, I already knew uh, from him or the, the partner that he had two young children. Uh, he was deeply missed, uh, acutely grieved by everyone in the Phoenix. It wasn't Scottsdale, it was actually the Phoenix uh, Police Department. And, so thank you for listening to me. Just wanted to share. 
In the meantime, for more weird stuff, tune in to also uh, Seattle Ions, www.seattleions.org. Uh, actually, we are the oldest NDE support group in the world. Uh, I co-founded it in June of 1982. And on the very day, at the very hour, 39 years ago, when I co-founded Seattle Ions, I will be speaking at the SAI conference. It's at 1.30 Pacific time. That is when Seattle's, we meet at that time. We've always met at 1.30, I don't know why, on the half hour, we just always have. Yvonne had no idea when she assigned me that time. She just is learning it right now for the first time. Oh, the weirdness just keeps going. So uh, I look forward to seeing you all uh, at the conference. Uh, Seattle Ions is one of the co-sponsors along with a bunch of other groups. And then also invite you to actually attend a good part of a Seattle Ions meeting on Netflix. Netflix did a series called Surviving Death. And episode one is on the near-death experience. It's fantastic, very high production values because uh, Netflix has got a lot of money. And they came and filmed a meeting. So I invite you to check that out. In the meantime, thank you so much, Dr. Richard Kelly, for uh, exploding my brain <laughs> and uh, touching my heart and for, I hope, becoming a, a lifelong friend. And again, speaking of friends, another greeting to those I know who are online. I can see you. <laughs> I love you. And God bless us one and all. Thank you. Robert? I'm going to do a few closing remarks. And I'm going to echo Kimberly's uh, comments, Dr. Kelly. You did a great job. You've knocked it out of the park today. I think this will be an iconic thing that will go viral. I really do. It was absolutely awesome. Of course, I'm speaking as a 23-year veteran of a police department. I'm one of those one in six that you referred to. I think you said it was 17%. I'm one of those. And just like your message resonated with me in Philadelphia, this did as well. Thank you for doing this on our behalf. And I also want to thank uh, Seattle Alliance for co-sponsoring this event. And I want to remind everybody that the third Saturday of every month, Spiritual Awakenings International, SAI, uh, hosts a speaker and a variety of topics. We're not just limited to one thing. We're, we have no dogma, we're wide, we're wide open. And this is one of them that we had. So please tune in. And as Kimberly talked about, we do have our conference coming up June uh, 12th, which is a Saturday and June 13th, which is a Sunday. It's free. We're gonna have 22 international speakers six Circle of Honor presenters, and Kimberly Clark Sharp is one of those on our Circle of Honor. Same thing with Dr. Yvonne Kaysan. But we're gonna have six total. And we're gonna also launch our NDE Talking Dead panel, our STE Experiencer panel, and our first Spanish or Espanol Language Experiencers panel. And SAI was co-founded by experiencers, for experiencers. We are here to help support each other. We're a safe harbor. Again, we're now in 56 countries, over 1,400 subscribers, scads of affiliated groups, and we hope that you will spread the word. We hope to see you in, in June. And Hope that you take a look at our website or share this with others, www.spiritualawakeningsinternational.org. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Yvonne Kason. And thank you all for coming to this event. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. 
So I once again want to thank uh, Dr. Richard Kelly for his absolutely outstanding presentation. Um, this touches me very close to the heart because my son and my daughter-in-law are both first responders. They're uh, paramedics, EMS uh, uh, dispatchers. So um, thank you for this incredible, outstanding presentation. And I want to thank everyone for coming and to remind everyone that this video will be posted on our SAI website. Give it a few days. All the videos of all our events are posted on our SAI website. And new, we just launched in the last week, our Spiritual Awakenings International YouTube channel. So please go on to YouTube, subscribe to our SAI YouTube channel, and we will be posting videos at a later date, one by one, we are posting the videos also on our YouTube channel. So uh, lots of ways you can watch our videos. So with that, I want to say goodbye to everybody. I hope to see you at our conference in June. So uh, goodbye. Au revoir, auf Wiedersehen, adios, buenos tardes, arrivederci, dach, farewell, and ciao, everybody, ciao.